This presentation is on the passions according to Catholic moral theology. When we use the term passions in moral theology, we are really referencing uh, what are simply referred to as feelings or emotions. And of course, we need to discuss them and how they are related to the moral life. A very basic definition of the passions or the emotions is a desire of the sensual appetite to act or not to act with reference to good or evil. So what can be seen here is in this first part, the desire of the sensual appetite is the essence of the definition. Um, an emotion or a passion is a desire, and it is a desire specifically in the sensual appetite of the human person, or as we'll see, any animal. Um, the second portion here is really just indicating the purpose or the result of these passions or emotions in that they are things we experience that enable us to act or um, motivate us to act or possibly to not act, um, depending upon whether action is necessary or not. And uh, the third part here is that it's always with the reference to good or evil. Emotions or passions always have kind of an object um, in sight, something we perceive to be good or evil, and it's based upon perceiving that good or evil, whatever it be, that we end up having the emotion or the passion. So um, to understand this a bit more, we have to go a little further into the sensible appetite. So the first part of the sensible appetite, getting to understand what this appetite is. The appetite, um, in any way, whether it's the sensible appetite or intellective appetite um, about the person, is a natural desire or inclination for realizing some good or some flourishing. And so the sensible appetite is a natural desire for realizing our good or our flourishing. But what makes it sensible is the second bullet here. It's the fact that it's an appetite that resides in the animal soul. So basically, it's something we share with animals. So humans have all the capacities of an animal soul. And of course, all animals have that same capacity. And basically, we're referring to the irrational, sensitive part of us. All right? Those things that happen to us um, without the use or the permission of our intellect or reason. And basically what we're referring to is sense experience. It's because we are sensing beings that we can experience emotions, which means also animals can experience emotions because they have sense experience as well. The, uh, the critical point about this is that the emotions or the passions, the sensible appetite, is really that nexus, that connection point between the body and the soul. The, um, the fact that we can see on scientific instruments um, um, readouts or indications that we have bodily uh, reactions to seemingly spiritual things um, is, is really right in the emotions. The fact that we can see changes in the chemical makeup of the brain, changes in um, uh, wave patterns in the brain, also even physical um, um, manifestations, whether it be uh, sweating, flushing, body temperature irregularities uh, connected with emotions um, indicates that this is really um, what those readouts are indicating and in that there is a connection between the body and the soul uh, which is communicated through the emotions of the passions. And finally, the passions exist ultimately to enable us to act or to not act. If we're, if we're as, as beings trying to flourish, trying to realize our good uh, or to avoid something that is evil, um, that is going to necessitate us acting in certain ways or not acting in certain circumstances. And so the passions really enable us to do that or motivate us to do that. So let's look at the passions themselves. This looks like a complicated chart, and so I want to try to break it down. Um, but this really just indicates the kind of basic emotions or labels that we can put on emotions. I want to start here with the good. And so we can see in this chart that uh, emotions, um, as we said, have in their object or in their perception something that is perceived as good or evil. Um, and in this blue section here, this top portion all across, this is the general um, association that we have with good and evil. It's called classically the concupiscible appetites or passions, the concupiscible passions. And this just basically means when I perceive something in general that I think is good, what are my emotions? Well, first and foremost, any perceived good is uh, elicits the base passion, the most foundational passion 
of love. Love is that just general desire for something that is good. Joy is the passion that is elicited of a good, a perceived good that we possess. It's present. It's here now. Desire is that passion that's elicited towards a good which is absent. So um, in my love for books, I can say that good books are, are things that I, that I want, I desire. I have a general kind of foundational love for books. When I order a book on Amazon and it finally arrives and I have it in my hands, I delight or I joy in that good that's present. Um, or if I've ordered it on Amazon and it's not quite here yet, it's, uh, I desire it. I still have this kind of lingering desire um, that's not fulfilled until it's in my hands. Um, whereas, and those are just general connections. So on the flip side of that coin, we have evil, a perceived evil. Um, you might take uh, the holidays, for instance, when I'm going to gather with my families, and a perceived evil is this uh, conversation with my Protestant family about me becoming Catholic. And so, in general, having that conversation might be uncomfortable. And so I would say that I see that as an evil, and I have this kind of general hatred for it. I I don't have any desire for it. In fact, um, I don't want to be near it. I dislike it. The idea uh, doesn't bode well, even in my mind. And so you can say I have a general hatred of the idea of discussing that with my family. Now, let's say that I'm at Christmas dinner and we're around the table and they start to have that conversation. They bring up that conversation with me. Well, now that thing that I, that I hate, it's present. It's here now. They've started that conversation. So what, uh, what's my feeling? Um, ultimately, sadness. It's sadness of the fact that I have to endure this. All right. Um, but let's say, well, okay, I'm not quite home yet. I'm on the eight-hour drive back to North Carolina to visit my family when I know it's a possibility that they may bring this conversation up. Well, I'm thinking in my mind, how can I avoid it? What can I do to ensure that I don't have this conversation? And so this general uh, emotion or passion of aversion, doing what I can to avoid that particular evil, right? So these examples that I've given you up here of the concupiscible appetites are just general emotions that are elicited with a very general connection of something we perceive to be good or evil. Now, this portion down here in the red called the irascible appetites are called irascible because the Latin term that's in the root here for irascible really means kind of um, anger or very, very passionate um, with the object being difficult or um, really serious or grave. Um, and so we, we perceive the good either to be a really significant good or a good that's difficult to attain. Um, and then on the flip side, the evil is something that's very significant or grave or that's very, very difficult to avoid. Um, and so um, this, this portion here where it says NA, which stands for non-applicable, uh, would mean what would be our desire for a good which was um, difficult to attain that is now present? Well, there's no separate emotion for that. Any good that is present, we would experience joy. Whereas, let's say the good is absent, but that good that's absent is very, very difficult to attain. Then we have hope. This corresponds to essentially heaven. Heaven seems to be something very difficult to attain. And so we don't just desire heaven. We need something a bit more. We have a, an emotion that is elicited more out of us, and that's hope. To have true hope. It, it really makes no sense to say, I hope that my ordered um, from Amazon arrives. Um, I, I'm, I'm relatively assured that it's going to arrive. I just have a desire for it. I'm not relatively assured that I'm going to get to heaven. Uh, so I have more than just a desire to give it, get to heaven. I need something more. I need hope. Whereas despair, despair is that, that emotion that is elicited out of us in reference to a significant good that's completely unattainable or we think it's completely unattainable. Some people think that they will never make it to heaven and so they despair. Some people think that they will never get um, the job that they want because of their difficulty and circumstances and so they despair. They are completely downcast because of something that is so good but so difficult if not impossible to attain and so this emotion of despair 
despair is really an emotion that is elicited in front of some good that is seen as impossible um, to attain because it's either too difficult or it's just um, it's not in our capabilities. Whereas on the flip side, with with a perceived evil, a perceived grave evil that's very difficult to avoid. Um, let's use the uh, the example of say uh, war. All right. As a soldier, we, we know that we're going into battle, and if that and if that threat, that perceived threat of our enemy is coming, but we we think or we know that we can um, prevail, that we can fight the good fight and win, then we we have elicited within ourselves the emotion of the passion of courage. This is. Um, the, the passion that we have in the face of a threatening evil, but we see that evil is conquerable. And so the courage allows us to face that evil that's coming. But what if that evil is coming and we don't think we can win? We don't think we have the numbers or the, uh, the prowess or the ability to, um, to defeat that enemy. Well, then fear comes into play. Um, and fear is that emotion that we have in the face of a grave evil that there's really nothing we can do about. But either way, we perceive that evil. When it arrives, we are angry. Why? Well, the evil that's present is an injustice to us. We think that we have been deprived of justice or something evil has been done to us, and we want revenge. We want justice to be done, and so our anger actually rouses within us the, uh, the possibility that this evil can be eventually um, justly punished or justly avenged. And so that's why anger here is, um, is actually, um, we can, we're going to talk later on in the semester about how it can be negative or how it can be indeed wrong, but anger can also be for a good in that it, it rouses us um, uh, towards hope, hope of avenging this evil and righting the wrong of restoring justice, of restoring what is good. Now, how can these passions be moral? Well, We'll get to that. Um, first of all, to have these passions is morally neutral. Um, if if I perceive something to be evil and therefore I hate it, that's neither here nor there. It's neither good nor bad. Um, if I um, every time I see a commercial for pizza and I have this general desire or love to f eat pizza, that's neither moral or immoral. It's completely amoral, to be quite honest. So our emotions are first and foremost in themselves. That means just looking at the emotions that we have, they're morally neutral. They become morally qualified when we, using our reason and our will, engage our emotions. Meaning, it's one thing for me to have an emotion, it's another thing for me to then act based upon that emotion. Right? Just because I have a particular emotion towards something doesn't mean I need to necessarily act with regard to that. And so it's once we, once we interact with that emotion, with our reason, with our will, that those passions can become morally qualified, meaning they could be good, could be bad. Now, the perfection for man, the fullness of man, is that his passions should be governed by reason and will. Not that we don't have any passions at all, but that when we have those passions, they are then immediately filtered through and checked by our reason and our will. Meaning, we ask ourselves, why are we having these emotions? And what am I going to do with these emotions? What would be the right thing for me to do, even though I'm having these emotions? And so, if those um, passions contribute to good actions, then we can say they are rightfully morally good. Whereas if those passions contribute ultimately to bad actions, we would say that the emotions themselves were were bad insofar as we made bad use of them. Now in the days to come and in our class discussion, um, we will look at some examples. We'll kind of break this out. This is just kind of a general introduction, but want to um, go into more detail in class discussion on how this is possible that these passions interact with um, the reason and the will to morally qualify our actions.